Thank you everyone for joining the webinar today, where we're gonna focus on the nuts and bolts of Georgia's annual state budget and why it matters to families, the economy, and communities across our state. I'm Wesley Tharp and I serve as research director here at GBPI. Over the next 40 to 45 minutes, myself and our team of analysts will walk through the bottom line of what you need to know about state revenues and spending, then we'll answer questions at the end. Some quick housekeeping notes. Whenever you think of a question, you can go ahead and type it in the box on the right side of your screen. We'll get to as many of them as we can at the end and then follow up with directly follow up directly with anyone whose question we don't have time to get to. Second, this webinar is being recorded, so we'll email out a copy to all participants later on. And third, I'd also like to note that more information beyond the basics we'll discuss here today are available in our official 2019 budget primer, one of GBPI's signature publications, which is available on the homepage of our website. So a quick word about who we are. GBPI is an independent nonpartisan group that produces research and recommendations on key issues facing Georgia, such as taxes, education, and healthcare, with the goal being to advance lasting solutions to expand economic opportunity and well being for all Georgians. This slide is just a quick rundown of the core policy areas where we focus our work and where the analyst team and I will be focusing the conversation today. So to kick things off, where I'd like to start is by answering a basic question. When there are so many critical issues facing Georgians today overall, on anything from, say, civil rights to the economy, why focus on the state budget at all? And the answer is that if you care about having a state where all people have access to economic opportunity, where communities have the resources they need to thrive, and where the economy is designed in a way that works for everyone, the budget is probably the most important piece of state policy to understand. The annual spending plan touches the lives of basically every Georgian in one way or another every day. It pays for about 1.7 million kids to get a decent K through 12 public education and another 2 million people to get health services through Medicaid, Peach Care and other health services. What our elected officials choose to put in the budget, or in some cases leave out, says a great deal about their priorities and their desire to truly change the state for the better. <clears throat> With that, let me touch on a few basics. First is that the state spending plan runs on what is called a fiscal year, which in Georgia begins each July 1st and ends each June 30th. So we are currently operating under Georgia's 2019 budget until the middle of next year. Second is that crafting and implementing the budget is essentially a year round process for state government. The budget is always being put together in the last few months of the year. Lawmakers debate and approve it from January to May, and then agencies immediately get to work putting it into place and getting to work designing next year's spending plan uh, during uh, the summer and into the next fall of the following year. More precise details on this process are available in the GBPI budget primer that I noted at the outset. So when all the steps involved in developing the budget are done, Georgia winds up with its final approved spending plan for the year. Here's what that looks like for our current, current 2019 fiscal year that began July 1st. At nearly $47 billion overall, the budget includes $26.2 billion in state funds 14 billion in federal funds, which go in large part to things like healthcare and human services, and 6.6 .6 billion in what we simply call other funds, which consist largely of tuition payments at colleges and universities, plus various other fees. You'll notice in the chart on the right that the 26.2 billion comes from adding together all the different slices uh, for, of state money for state general funds, which are revenues coming from standard taxes and fees, motor fuel revenue, lottery funds, and dollars that Georgia receives through a large legal settlement, settlement with the nation's tobacco companies. When thinking about state spending overall, the core part of the story to understand and what we'll be focusing mostly on today are Georgia's 26.2 billion in state funds, which lawmakers have the most discretion over how to spend. I wanna to touch on essentially three top line points right now 
about these state funds. One is that almost every year, more than two thirds of taxes and fees Georgia collects go to two core functions of state government, education and healthcare. Roughly the remaining third of the budget covers all the remaining stuff that state government does, transportation, economic development, public safety and human services. The second main point is that you may have heard about how Georgia's budget has grown a great deal over time, up by about $10 billion over the past two decades before adjusting for inflation. But keep in mind that over that time, Georgia has grown enormously as a state, bringing in more than 2 million additional residents, which means more kids attending schools, more drivers on the road, and a variety of other aspects of growth. Put another way, Georgia's budget may be the largest in state history, but is it keeping up? And the simple answer is probably not. If you were to take Georgia's budget from the year 2000 and simply project it out based on population and inflation, it'd actually be more like $29 billion today. In other words, that translates to about a $3 billion annual gap between how much Georgia spends and what may be a fair characterization of the state's true needs. And third, it's important to understand that even though the budget increases overall each year, in good economic times rising by about a billion dollars annually or more, most of those new dollars get eaten up by the naturally rising needs of a growing state. By our estimates, about 64% of the additional $1.2 billion in the 2019 spending plan goes to just four things, shoring up the pension system for uh, K through 12 public school teachers, rising need in Medicaid, more kids in public schools, and more young adults in colleges and universities. I'll be personally coming back at the end to say a few words about where all the money for this spending comes from in terms of tax revenue. But in the meantime, I will pass things off to Stephen Owens, our senior policy analyst for K through 12 education. Hey everyone, my name is Steven and I'm the K-12 Education Policy Analyst. As Wes mentioned, education is the largest expenditure in the state budget as it makes up more than 40% of the state's expenses. This year, the Department of Education has been allocated a shade under $10 billion, which represents a $624 million increase for education. Most of that $600 million will go to shoring up retirement benefits for teachers and restoring previous cuts. I'm not gonna go into the specifics now, but if anyone would like to better understand what's happening with Georgia's teacher retirement system, I'd love to explain their financial situation better in the questions at the end of this webinar or in any follow-up emails. Georgia's education funding is dictated by a formula set up under the Quality Basic Education Act that was passed in 1985. Georgia, like every state save Hawaii, funds schools with a mixture of local, state, and federal dollars. In the fiscal year 2017, Local taxes made up 40%, and the state accounted for 53% of school revenues. The last 7% comprised federal dollars tied to Title I and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. The past 16 years have seen dramatic cuts to education from state funds, as you can see from this chart. School districts had to make difficult decisions while billions less were given from the state each year. Some of the wealthiest districts have been able to make up these gaps with local taxes, while many others were forced to cut services. For the first time since fiscal year 2002, QBE will be fully funded. Fully funding education has been several years in the making and marks an important milestone for the state. It is important to note the effect of austerity cuts will be felt for years, however. One school year of larger class sizes or inadequate teaching materials has the potential to affect a student for several grades after. For reference, students who were in third grade when the state had an austerity cut of $1.36 billion in 2010 are this year's graduating class. Now let's take a deeper look at what those spending increases have been earmarked for. As mentioned, the majority will go to shoring up TRS and the restoration of cuts taken out due to austerity. The remaining third will go to account for natural enrollment growth, modest teacher raises, and to pay for increases in equalization a grant I'll explain in more detail later on. Even as austerity cuts disappear and TRS stabilizes, future budgets can be expected to expand based on the growing number of students educated. 
Georgia is projected to grow in public school enrollment by 6% over the next decade, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. As we continue to talk about fully funding Georgia's education formula, it's important to note that meeting this goal required a sort of sifting of the goalposts during the recession. In 2009, the state failed to fully fund the amount allocated for student transportation. Three years later, the state passed a law that passed responsibility to pay for bus drivers' health insurance from the state to the local districts. The result is that in 2017, local taxes accounted for 85% of student busing costs, a dramatic increase over the past 20 years. School districts without adequate local funds have been forced to keep older and potentially less safe buses on the road for this very reason. Similarly, equalization has undergone a series of decreases, which has allowed the state to meet its financial obligations more easily. Equalization grants are given to districts with a lower tax base in order to ensure that all districts can provide an adequate public education. Every district is ranked based on the amount raised via property taxes per student, and any district that falls below the state average for tax valuation is given funds to make up for the gap. By way of example, Long County schools were given over $1,200 per student through equalization in fiscal year 2018. For the first 13 years of QBE, any district that fell below the 90th percentile was given equalization dollars. In 2000, the threshold was changed to the 75th percentile. In 2012, the state lowered the cutoff again to its current level. The result of this change from the 75th percentile to state average is $836 million less given to the lowest wealth districts in fiscal year 2018 alone. Future education spending priorities could be forecast based on a number of issues that have gained traction in the years since the Great Recession. First, based on a Mason-Dixon poll the GBPI commissioned, a majority of those surveyed agreed with the statement that additional money should be allocated to those districts that serve high concentrations of students living in poverty. Next, both candidates for governor have mentioned plans to increase teacher salaries, an important point considering that salaries comprise the vast majority of expenditures within education spending. Finally, parents and teachers have, on numerous polls, listed school safety as their number one issue for public schools this year. Augmenting or changing systems around school safety could have a potentially large effect on future budgets if policymakers prioritized it. Now I'll hand it off to my colleague Jennifer Lee to discuss higher education spending. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lee and I'm the Higher Education Policy Analyst at GBPI. And I wanted to start by talking about why it's so important for the state to invest in higher education. All the data shows that people with higher education are more likely to find work and that people earn more with each step up in their education. Now we know that about two-thirds of jobs in, in Georgia require education or training beyond a high school diploma and that many Georgians are not yet up to that standard. So investing in higher education really represents an opportunity for Georgia Georgia to become a more prosperous state with more job opportunities for more people um, and for the state to become more economically competitive as a result. The other key reason that investing in higher education is so important for Georgia is that college is a key factor in economic mobility. It is one of the key pieces that make up the springboard to the middle class. Students from low-income families who attend college and get a college education are much more likely to become middle or high income adults. Simply investments that, in, that Georgia makes in higher education is a way to leverage all of the talent that is in Georgia's people. Now Georgia funds higher education through three different agencies. The University System of Georgia receives $2.4 billion. That's the vast majority of state funds for higher education. The Technical College System of Georgia receives uh, far less, receives about $369 million. And the Georgia Student Finance Commission is the third agency, uh, which receives $977 million. And a large portion of that are, are lottery dollars 
The Georgia Student Finance Commission is the agency that administers the lottery funded HOPE scholarships and grants. Now, when we look at the university system of Georgia funding, this is um, a total of $2.4 billion in the most recent budget. That is about a 5% increase from last year. And when we look at what makes up that increase, about half of that shores up retirement plans. As Wes mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, that is a large part of the overall budget increase that we've seen in Georgia. And the other half of that increase is due to formula funding increases. Colleges and universities in Georgia are funded through a formula like K-12 education that is largely based on enrollment and also the square footage of buildings um, and of campuses. If you look at the overall trends, you'll see that there was a very large dip in spending on the university system of Georgia during the recession and that we have yet to climb out of that hole. Now, when we look forward to the future, um, we know that the university system of Georgia um, will, we can expect a couple of changes. Um, we are expecting a small increase uh, in the budget for next year to spend on complete college Georgia initiatives, um, which is an initiative by the university system of Georgia to invest in student success and in making sure that the students that we have are completing college. When we look at the technical college system of Georgia, the overall budget is $326 million. This budget has basically been flat for the last few years. You'll again see the trend with a very large dip during the recession that the technical college system has yet to climb out of. Last year, we saw that TCSG had more money in their budget for marketing their programs um, so that people know about the pro programs that TCSG offers. And we expect to see um, that continue in future budgets. One thing to note that is not included in the state funds budget is that the Governor's Office of Workforce Development transferred to the technical college system last year, which included $82 million in federal funds, although no state funds went with that change. The newest piece of the higher education budget is the dual enrollment program. Dual enrollment is a program where high school students can attend college for free. Um, although it is at no cost to them, the state is paying their tuition uh, for the college courses that they are taking. It is the newest and fastest growing item in the higher education budget. You'll see in the last four years, um, spending on dual enrollment has more than doubled. Last year, we saw a couple of changes in the budget regarding dual enrollment. There was a 15 credit hour cap that was put into place per semester. And the Georgia Student Finance Commission was directed to develop and report a priority list of courses that leads to a degree or an in-demand certificate or diploma. So we expect that in the future there will be some effort to contain the costs of this fast-growing program. All of the spending that I've talked about for the university system, technical college system, and dual enrollment is state funding. Um, but lottery funding is also a large piece of how we fund higher education in Georgia. Lottery funds totaled $1.2 billion, and about two-thirds of that will go to higher education, mostly through the HOPE scholarship and grant programs, and a third of that will go to Georgia's pre-K program. The last thing to note is that when we look at the way that Georgia funds financial aid in Georgia, there are two different ways to look at it. First is that the vast majority of the money does come through lottery funds. Georgia kicks in just a small amount from state dollars for scholarship programs. Um, the biggest state funded programs in financial aid are the tuition equalization grant for students who attend private colleges. Um, the REACH program, and then some small scholarship programs um, for um, students who are intending to join the military. The other way to look at it is the financial aid that is based on um, financial need versus other considerations such as GPA or test scores. And the vast majority of funds in 
uh, scholarship funds in Georgia go only to what is commonly called merit aid. Georgia is actually one of the only states who lacks a need-based aid program. Now the state did pass in legislation last year the structure for the state's very first need-based aid program, but it is not currently funded in the budget. So that is an, a big opportunity for the future when we look at uh, what is included in the higher education budget. Um, Georgia does make a big investment through lottery funds in the HOPE scholarship program, um, but one big opportunity that we are missing is um, an opportunity to invest in those low-income students that really see college as that springboard to the middle class and to greater financial security and job opportunities in the future. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Laura Harker, who will be talking about health. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm Laura Harker, and I'm the health policy analyst. And, um, oops. And I'll talk to you a little bit today about the health care budget and some opportunities for how to improve spending in the health budget. As you heard earlier, health care is the second largest expenditure in the state's budget, making up about 19% of the state's total expenditures. And this $4.8 billion for 2019 includes $4.2 billion in the general fund, as well as a little over $600 million in other sources, such as the nursing home fees and hospital provider fees. There are a total of three agencies focused on health, and the general fund spending for these three agencies increased by $305 million from the previous year, 2018. And this was mostly due to program enrollment growth, as well as rising health care costs, um, such as high prescription drug prices, as well as replacing federal funds that are lost um, as the federal funds adjust each year based on the state's average income. The first agency, which is the largest, is the Department of Community Health, and this mostly operates the Medicaid program. That's the majority of the spending. And the Medicaid program covers low-income residents in the state. It's a state and federal partnership. The federal government pays for about two-thirds of the cost of the program, and Georgia kicks in about one-third of the cost. And with the Medicaid program, we're able to cover one in four Georgians. Um, and this uh, Medicaid, as well as Peach Care, which is a program for children who are in families with a little bit higher incomes than the Medicaid requirements, and that's about 130,000 kids in that program, as well as the State Health Benefit Plan, which provides coverage to teachers and state employees. And that's administered by this department, but it's paid for through employee contributions, so it's not included in the department's budget. And you'll see also one in two children are covered through this programs. Spending on Medicaid, the majority of it, as you see in the bottom chart or bottom graph, um, with the spending, most of it is on the elderly, blind, and disabled population. And these are folks who qualify for Medicaid because they have a disability or they're a senior who has very low assets and needs some additional help to pay for services that Medicare does not cover. And Medicaid does pay for about three quarters of the nursing home care. It's a big payer for long-term services and also home-based services for people who need help in their homes um, because they have a disability. But even though the most of the spending is for this population, seniors and people with disabilities, the majority of the enrollees are actually children. About two thirds of the enrollees are children. Um, and Georgia is one of the more restrictive Medicaid programs when it comes to who is eligible to receive coverage. Not that many adults are able to receive coverage through Medicaid in Georgia. Adults with children can only qualify for Medicaid if they make less than about $8,000 a year for a family of three. So very restrictive. Um, with pregnant women, there is a little bit of a higher income threshold but you're only able to enroll when you're pregnant and then you lose coverage 60 days after your birth. And Medicaid does pay for half of all the births in Georgia um, due to this eligibility. But non-disabled adults are not able to qualify for Medicaid in Georgia if they don't have children. Uh, and this is because Georgia is one of the 17 states that has not decided to expand Medicaid eligibility and provide health coverage for 470,000 Georgians. 
and state lawmakers still have this opportunity in the next year um, to accept $3 billion in federal money each year to pay for about 90% of the cost to help it reduce the high uninsured rate in Georgia and help more people get coverage. And so I have a quick question here to try to give you some perspective on how Georgia's Medicaid spending compares to other states. So this is just a question about where you think Georgia ranks in healthcare spending, Medicaid spending per enrollee. Okay, so if you guessed 46, you were right. Um, it does sound like a lot of money when you look at the Medicaid budget, but when you look at the fact that it covers about 2 million people, it's really modest based on national standards. Um, Georgia's Medicaid investment comes in about 32% below the national average. And given Georgia's high rates of poverty and poor health outcomes relative to many other states, it really suggests a need for more healthcare spending. And there are still opportunities for a greater investment in Medicaid through expanding health services, as well as looking at increasing the rates paid to providers. The next largest department is the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, which was created as a separate agency in 2009. Um, they entered into a legal settlement in 2010 with the United States Department of Justice, and that really put the state on a plan to move services out of the state hospitals and more into community-based institutions. The department does still operate five state hospitals, but they also operate about 25 community service boards, and those provide services um, for behavioral health, mostly for the uninsured and people on Medicaid. Um, one of the uh, concerns in Georgia is around the rising um, need in behavioral health. In the past few years, drug overdoses and suicide deaths have increased rapidly in Georgia. Drug overdose deaths increased by 35 percent from 2012 to 2016, and suicide has increased 25 percent in that same period. And this accelerating crisis has called for an increase in funding for mental health and substance abuse treatment and prevention. We did see a significant addition this year for children's behavioral health services. Um, including about $6 million for um, Behavioral Health Crisis Center, as well as $5.9 million for crisis services for children. And there's also a number of um, more work being done to prioritize prevention around suicide prevention programs and opioid abuse prevention. And this is a good start to increase the availability of services and supports. Um, but there's still some areas where we need to catch up from recession era cuts, including more substance abuse prevention services for all ages, um, and a sustained investment will really be needed to respond to Georgia's growing need for behavioral health services. And the last of the three agencies is the Department of Public Health, and they operate um, programs that are focused on health promotion, disease prevention, as well as emergency prepared, um, preparedness. Um, and most of those funds are for grants to local health departments to operate programs, uh, including vaccines and other preventative services, as well as infant and child health programs. A notable addition for this year is $2 million that was added to uh, increase the review of ma maternal mortality cases and make sure that we're able to really understand the causes of maternal deaths and to prevent um, that growing issue in Georgia. And now I'll pass it to Alex, who will talk a little bit more about human services. Thank you, Laura. Again, my name is Alex and I'm the economic mobility analyst on our team and I will uh, walk us through budget highlights from the Department of Human Services. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar with the agency, Human Services oversees divisions that support Georgia's elderly and children. Those divisions include the Division of Aging Services, Child Support Services, and Family and Children Services. Family and Children Services, or DFACS, gets a great deal of attention since it administers the state's federal safety net programs like Medicaid, TANF, and SNAP, or previously known as food stamps, as well as child welfare and foster care. 
These investments are the largest in the department's budget. The total DHS budget for FY 2019 amounts to $797 million, or just about 3% of total state spending. First, I want to dive into what's happening with child welfare. Uh, it's important to distinguish between child welfare and foster care because they are often described interchangeably. But to clarify, child welfare reviews and investigates cases of child maltreatment, while the foster care system is tasked with placing children in safe out of home care. As you can see here, child welfare reports have been on the rise for several years, doubling in Georgia from just about 67,859 in 2012 to about 123,000 in 2017. The higher volume in abuse reports has prompted some needed increases in the child welfare budget particularly as it relates to addressing trauma. The 2019 budget includes $980,000 more for child advocacy centers. This will support an increase in equipment and therapeutic medical and outreach services. These nonprofit centers coordinate directly with the department in the investigation of child abuse and offer abuse prevention education for professionals and adults. The budget also allots about $2.2 million for 19 new care coordinator positions that will be tasked with working with foster youth. This comes directly from Georgia's Commission on Children's Mental Health recommendations to extend access to services for children dealing with social emotional trauma in the foster care system. Next up is foster care. Georgia's foster care system will see a bump in funding. There are about 14,500 young people in the system, up 11% from 2016. To explain this rise in cases, the department and policymakers, along with many other professionals on the front lines, have pointed to the opio opioid crisis as one of the largest culprits. Georgia's foster care system depends heavily on loving families being able to care for children in a stable home environment. One way the state supports fostering for families is by providing cash to offset the cost of caring for an additional youth in the home. The state reimburses a family that fosters children. This is designed to cover food, shelter, clothing, basic supervision, and oversight. The 2019 budget adds about $20.3 million to complete a two-part increase that raises per diem rates for foster families by a total of $10, bringing per diem rates from about $15 to $19 per day to $25 to $30 per day, depending on the age of the child and the type of placement. The budget also includes $2.4 million more for a 2.5% per diem rate increase for child caring institutions, otherwise known as group homes. Next up, we have our safety net programs for low-income Georgians that are administered by Human Services. This involves the administration of Medicaid benefits, SNAP, and the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program, aka TANF. These programs are critical for adults who are unemployed or in low-wage work and their children. Caseworkers in these programs can help launch those adults into quality career pathways when there's enough capacity to do so. About $119 million in the budget covers the salaries of frontline staff that screen for benefits eligibility, process referrals, and manage client cases. The actual benefits themselves are paid out through federal funds. Over the last few years, the state investments for these administrative services have remained relatively flat. However, the demand for these services have not. In fact, many of Georgia's counties are still recovering from the Great Recession and are struggling to provide sufficient employment opportunities to help move people off of these public benefits. This final budget item I want to discuss is actually not part of the Department of Human Services. Child care assistance in the state is administered by the Department of Early Care and Learning, or DECAL. 
but it is included here because we consider childcare to be an extremely important work support for low-income Georgians. The high cost of childcare can be a huge financial obstacle for parents who want to continue working. In 2017, the average annual cost of care for an infant in Georgia was $7,769. The average cost was $4,000 for school-age child. These costs can easily consume nearly half of a low-income family's budget, depending on family size. The state's child care subsidy program, CAPS, is a crucial work support and serves about 54,000 children per week, but more than 623,000 children in low-income working families are likely in need of affordable, quality care. We could reach more, but there are significant funding limitations. Lawmakers added $5.5 million in the 2018 budget for the child care subsidy program using state general funds to supplant federal dollars used to fund the subsidy. This was the first new state money for child care assistance in 10 years. But the 2019 budget does not build on that momentum. More robust funding of the state's child care assistance program is still needed to ensure that all Georgia parents with children up to four years and old can afford high quality center-based child care. That wraps up uh, these sections of the DHS budget, but I did want to give a snapshot of some of the budget increase proposals that are being made by the Department of Human Services for 2020. In line with the growth of foster care placements, the agency is requesting an additional million dollars for caseworkers who will manage adoptions. They will also be asking for $3 million to fund the development of a new combined online reporting system uh, for foster care and child welfare. You also see here an ask to increase staff capacity to administer Medicaid benefits to individuals who are over the age of 65, blind, or have a disability, and about $1.9 million to add 1,000 additional non-Medicaid slots for home-based and community care for seniors. Next up, I'll turn it over to Wesley to discuss taxes and the state budget. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. So just to close things out, I'd like to say a few quick words about where the money for all this annual spending comes from and then how to think about taxes in the context of state policymaking. This chart shows the various taxes, fees, and other revenue streams that account for Georgia's $26.2 billion in annual state funds. You'll notice that nearly half of state revenue comes from income taxes, in particular the personal rather than corporate income tax. This is something that's important to keep in mind anytime you hear candidates or lawmakers talking about proposals to cut or perhaps even eliminate Georgia's income tax. An about another quarter of revenue comes from Georgia's general sales tax, and the remainder comes from things such as taxes on cars and gasoline and various fees, uh, various fees across state government, as well as sales from the state lottery. Now, $26 billion, I know, certainly seems like a lot of money overall, and in many ways it is. But it's important to know at the same time that compared to other states, Georgia chooses to run a relatively lean operation when it comes to how much money we choose to raise from taxes and invest in public needs. Georgia today ranks 44th in the amount of state and local revenue it collects per person, for example. Also, the share of income that Georgians commit to state taxes has also fallen significantly uh, from the 1990s to today. That falling percentage is one of the reasons for past cuts in things like K-12 education and other services. To close out the presentation, I'd like to make a point that, you know, nobody likes paying taxes, of course, overall, right? But at the end of the day, taxes are how we come together to pay for things that address shared challenges and pursue common goals. In other words, tax policy on the state level or local or federal level is all about choices. For example, in this year's legislative session, Georgia lawmakers approved a plan that will cost about $1.5 billion a year in lost revenue once fully phased in over the next few years. It'll provide the average Georgia household probably somewhere around $100 uh, in savings each year. 
Whatever you think about that choice, and reasonable people can disagree, just for context, I would note that a rough, for a roughly equivalent amount of money, lawmakers could have instead chosen to expand Medicaid, fund a need-based aid college program, make technical colleges in Georgia tuition-free, enact an earned income tax credit for working families, and created a universal child care program for low-income children younger than five. It's these sorts of choices that drive people like us and organizations like GBPI to take the budget so seriously and to strive uh, to work for better solutions across a range of policy issues in our state. With that, thank you very much for your time, and we will pivot to questions. I believe we'll start on a few of the ones that we've already had come in over the course of the presentation, uh, but absolutely feel free to uh, keep typing them in and we'll get to as many as we can over about the next uh, 20 minutes if there are that many questions. So the first one that's come in is going back to one of the earlier slides talking about how a Georgia budget that uh, would have kept up with natural growth a little better would be more like $29 billion today as opposed to about the $26 billion that it is. In other words, what would um, what would a $29 billion budget mean for Georgia compared to where we are now? I think a short answer to this, and I will certainly let the other analysts uh, jump in and share additional details to the extent they like, is that a $29 billion budget would both better allow Georgia to keep up with the naturally rising needs of growth, as well as allow more room for bold investments in, uh, in people and in infrastructure in a variety of public services. For example, uh, with say an extra, you know, couple of billion dollars a year, uh, uh, Georgia could do things like expand Medicaid, invest more in substance abuse in rural hospitals, uh, start a new child care program, um, do things like support need-based aid, make more robust investments in college and education, and could do things uh, like more fully support K through 12 education, rather than just going, rather than just fully funding the QBE formula as was, as was done this year, to make bolder investments in the types of best practices uh, that we see in research and we see from across the country. There are a variety as well of sort of less visible aspects of state government that can gain from a more robust budget over time. These are things like additional, say, inspectors in the Department of Labor to look into things uh, like wage and uh, violations. During the recession, there was an incredible backlog of things like elevators that had not been inspected in many years. There are things like strengthening the ability of state agencies to have um, the amount of workforce, the amount of people that they need in place to have a well-functioning foster care system and a variety of other types of services like that. This is Jennifer Lee. I'm the higher education analyst here at GBPI. And um, in higher education, one very concrete effect of having a budget that keeps up with our population growth is lower tuition. Um, what we saw when the state cut funding to colleges and universities during the recession is that there was a very close relationship between um, the decrease in funding to colleges and universities and the amount that colleges raise tuition and fees to their students. So with stronger funding to colleges and universities, um, I what what could have been avoided was the increase, very fast increase in tuition costs that we saw to our students um, um, post those cuts around 2011. So that's just one example of a very concrete way that um, a stronger investment in the budget really impacts students and families on the ground. Hey, this is Stephen Owens again with K-12 Education Analysts. Um, but with a larger budget, as Wes mentioned, uh, not only would we be able to fully fund QBE during the last 16 years, uh, but it actually brings up an interesting point about uh, the Governor's Commission on Education in 2015, where the panel in charge of looking at education funding 
recognized a need for specific funding weight for students living in poverty. And that's important because Georgia is one of the few states in the union that doesn't have a weight specifically for kids um, in low income neighborhoods. And so at the time, the way they rationalized it was just changing around the existing pot of money. But if there was a strong, like vibrant budget, um, there was a lot of eagerness to include this as an additional weight, the same way that we do for, uh, for instance, students that are learning English, English language learners. Um, and so that would have offered, offered an opportunity to more equitably uh, distribute money, especially to our schools with really high concentrations of students living in poverty. So the next question we had come in is someone asked, I've heard about an idea to cap or constrain state spending. What would that mean for Georgia? I'll answer that one by saying that this is a policy that's been We've seen pop up in other states and has been talked about both off and on in Georgia over the years, as well as talked about in a variety of other states. And it's something that really has the potential for some possibly dire consequences uh, for the state of Georgia, for our ability to meet the public's needs and uh, the need to invest in things like education, healthcare, transportation, and a variety of other things over time. There's a couple of quick reasons for this I'll point to. One is that these sorts of policies typically lock state spending into an arbitrary formula uh, that usually is lower than what it actually costs to keep up with just the natural needs of growth. Things like more kids enrolling in school, uh, the needs to re need to repave the roads, so on and so forth. Let alone the need to potentially make bold new investments in things like uh, helping rural hospitals with Medicaid expansion, uh, again, expanding access to college with a need-based aid program or other strategies, uh, and uh, you know, various other investments that could do a lot of good for Georgia's people and communities, but might require, or likely would require more revenues than a, a hard and arbitrary state spending cap would allow. The second point I'll quickly make on this is that these sorts of policies oftentimes coincide with what's called a supermajority requirement to raise new revenues. Um, in other words, where it might be something like a two-thirds requirement in the state legislature uh, to temporarily or uh, permanently raise new revenues for a given challenge or need. An interesting example to think about and that, may, that might drive this home is that in 2015, as many people may know, Georgia passed uh, roughly $1 billion a year in new transportation revenues to try to unlock some of the congestion in Metro Atlanta, as well as uh, make additional investments in transportation statewide. That legislative accomplishment, which was bipartisan and widely praised, likely would not have been possible with something like a supermajority requirement to raise taxes or a spending cap. And so it does really tie the state's hands in uh, our ability to, to try to address challenges together. So someone asked, there are many programs that are not meeting the needs of families. There are a ton of waiting lists on things like disabilities, childcare, pre-K, et cetera. Would more money help with that? This is Laura Harker. I can start with um, the question around waiting lists. Um, there are waiting lists for people with disabilities to get services in their homes to help them get to work and to go to school and to um, participate in the, the economy and in their communities. Um, there's about 8,000 people on those waiting lists and definitely new money would help to eliminate those waiting lists. Um, right now, the Department of Behavioral Health tends to add about 100 or so slots a year, so it's really piece by piece. Um, but with more money, they'd be able to do that uh, more quickly than they are able to now. And this is Alex. I would say for the uh, child care piece, um, Georgia currently does not uh, publish waiting lists for child care. However, we know there's a great deal of folks who would benefit um, from the additional funding, especially if the state were to, to ramp up its funding to match the amount of uh, federal investment put in Georgia around increasing access to the subsidy. 
um, that could help get more people um, into the subsidized child care program. So um, while there isn't necessarily a waiting list uh, for that particular program, um, we know there is just a huge need for for access um, in our state um, that goes completely untapped. Um, but we know from anecdotally from listening sessions that we've done at GBPI, the huge need, you know, just talking directly to working parents, what the need is a lot of folks not even knowing where to sign up for for child care um, through through the state is is a big issue as well. So and then I'll pass it to Stephen on the pre K question. Yeah, this is Stephen again. Um, yeah, on the pre-K question, like Georgia is in this surprisingly good position when it comes to our four-year-olds pre-K by the fact that we're one of the few states that actually has universal pre-K. But it's a universal pre-K with a caveat that involves like signing up for uh, your top, you know, four options for a pre-K center and with no real guarantee that you'll get in a, any any of those options or even get a child care center that's close to your house or a pre-k school that's close to your house and so with additional like monies towards this we, we would be able to incentivize addi adding additional centers like especially in high population uh around the state uh, areas where there are more kids that are interested in pre-k um, because if you require a, a family to drive further away for their pre-K, it disproportionately affects those without any real access to transportation. Um, so we could increase the amount of grants for startup pre-K centers. We could include uh, additional cost for capital improvements, something that's not paid for in our pre-K formula currently. So if there's a business uh, that's operating pre-K that their AC breaks down, that's completely on them. That's not refunded uh, by DECAL. And so additional monies would absolutely help it make it even more of a universal pre-K system. And I believe the last question we have for the moment, unless anyone uh, thinks of additional ones here in the next few minutes, which we would also be well, happy to get to, someone asked, is this information for the 2019 budget that will be further adjusted during this legislative session? And that's a really great, great question and a clarification on process is that the current 2019 budget, which was approved in May and runs from uh, July 1st of this year through June 30th of 2019, will be further adjusted by lawmakers during the upcoming 2019 legislative session that runs from January to about the end of March. Uh, this is something that will be referred to as the amended 29 budget, uh, 2019 budget. Uh, this is where go uh, governor staff, uh, lawmakers, uh, you know, Analysts across state government will take a close look at revenues that have actually been coming in from taxes and fees, how they match up to what the projections for revenue look like when the budget was originally passed. And they'll kind of tinker uh, mostly around the edges with the funding levels uh, for all state agencies or most state agencies. And then in some cases, we'll potentially uh, spend a, a larger pot of money on a specific issue, a specific challenge in uh, the amended budget for 2019. And so that's something that will be going on uh, when we come into legislative session in January. We did have one uh, quick question come in, which is, is the rural hospital tax credit actually helping rural hospitals? Laura, can you help me with that one? Yes, this is Laura. Um, the Rural Hospital Tax Credit is run by the Department of Community Health, and it was a $60 million a year set aside as a credit to individuals or corporations who want to donate to a certain list of hospitals that are qualified um, in rural in rural communities. Um, the department has not released official numbers as far as how much of those hospitals um, are getting money and how much money they're getting. Um, so it's hard to say now. From news reports, we've seen a range of numbers um, from $500,000 from some hospitals to $1.2 million, um, but some hospitals may be only getting $2,000. Um, so it's a wide range. Um, we know that it's not really spread evenly as far as the benefits to hospitals, and they also 
also have to sign up to work with a consultant to help market the program and to get donors to donate. So there's some of that money that has to be put aside for the, the consultants. Um, but overall, we think that um, looking at longer term, uh, really helping to increase the number of people who are insured is a stronger way to help hospitals increase their revenue. Um, with expansion of Medicaid in other states, rural hospitals have seen average of two to three million dollars a year coming into their hospitals. So um, a longer term solution is to really look at uh, increasing coverage to help those hospitals deal with the fact that they see a lot of patients who don't have insurance now. So just in these final couple of minutes, unless there are, are one or two really last minute questions that come in for folks, a couple of things. One is that someone uh, did ask to clarify, will this webinar be available uh, online so that we can refer back to it later? The answer to that is yes. We'll be emailing it back out to everyone uh, with a link. We'll be emailing out to everyone with a link to the webinar, which will be available on our website. The second thing I'd just like to say in closing is that uh, we tried to get to a lot in this presentation today, but in, a, in many ways have really just been scratching the surface. And so there are a wide variety of resources available on our website, uh, such as our uh, uh, annual budget primer focused on the 2019 budget that, that really delves uh, into more details that we, than we were able to get to today. Uh, we'll also be coming out with additional resources on uh, what will become the 2020 budget as we get uh, as that is introduced by what will be the new governor uh, in early January. I'd also like to point people in closing to something on our website called People Power Prosperity, which is our proactive vision for how, how Georgia can build a fair and more prosperous economy through investments in some of the things that we have been talking about today, like K through 12 education, access to affordable childcare and affordable health coverage so that people can uh, stay productive and contribute to the economy in their communities. And so with that, um, I believe we are out of time and we are out of questions. And so um, I'd just like to thank everyone again for their your time and attention and um, have a great day.